So you can objectively determine that coffees are different from each other. And some of them are more liked by a certain group of people. Yeah, exactly. Okay. How do you do that objectively? With science. Okay. Show me. To be clear, there are some artistic fields where experts are just granted authority by virtue of how confident they sound and how charismatically they can deliver their judgment. In the past 25 years, for example, it's been shown that professional wine tasters have essentially no ability to tell the difference between a cheap bottle and an expensive one. Between variation in people's subjective preferences and the tricky business of measuring qualitative variables, do we have any grounds left to stand on? quality of coffee experience comes down to three things. The raw ingredients, water and coffee beans, and the brewing process. In the question of best water to brew with, my video about best brewing water relies on James Hoffman's World Atlas of Coffee, which in turn cites the Specialty Coffee Association of America guidelines. Since I didn't want to buy and read their $45 book, I started looking around for anything else to cue me in. I did find an article on the SCA website, which upon closer inspection was just something the Brita marketing people hastily wrote up. It is sourced. Loosely. Honestly, the sources look like something a rushed high school student would write. Some of their sources are just an entire chemistry book, the way some of my students will cite Wikipedia. Not any particular article on Wikipedia, just the whole thing at once, as if I'll be able to track down what they saw that way. Another of their sources is an entire 400-page book, at least one of their sources was misspelled, one of their sources is a German-language Wikipedia article about the odor threshold, and one of their sources I couldn't track down at all. Despite my frustration with locating some of these sources firsthand, I did find a few. There were a few citations of an entire 140-page book called Water for Coffee by Hendon and Kelowna Dashwood, as well as a 2014 paper with the same authors. In discussing things like water hardness, alkalinity, pH, they cite the Specialty Coffee Association of Europe water chart PDF, which provides a great deal of chemistry definitions background and a helpful brewing chart for best water to brew with. It doesn't tell anything about the evidence for these guidelines. That water chart PDF also cited Hendon and Kelowna Dashwood. So I called up Maxwell Kelowna Dashwood and asked him what sense to make of all of this. On one particular claim made by Brita about adding magnesium ions to brewing water, he said this. I don't know the study, I don't know how they did the test, what the data was, and I, I would also question the bias of it because Brita don't do magnesium and their direct competitor BWT does. And this was my general impression of the SCA's Brita written report about water, a hastily written, beautifully formatted piece of marketing propaganda for the Brita water filtration company. Maxwell also commented about how the science in his paper became distorted and decontextualized by companies to sell their magnesium-oriented products. So even the appearance of science in the commercial industry might not mean very much when being used to sell you something. But as far as the journal Brewing Water Chart, he indicated that the sensory experience of being at the far corners of the graph were so pronounced, this was just accepted within the coffee community without the need to sit down and do blinded trials. You know the graph like we did, we've got those extremes at the four quarters. Yeah, yeah. A hundred percent, I have never done a tasting where not every, everyone in the room can taste that. As Kelowna Dashwood states, you have to get pretty specific before you have the paper's worth of results. Papers are interesting because it's about asking a specific, clear question that can get peer-reviewed, which is not necessarily the same as just trying to understand the topic as a whole, right? In the vein of investigations so microscopically specific as to merit a published paper, I did find a paper of panelists doing tastings to report how strongly they detected various specific flavors as influenced by the hardness of the brewing water used. On the topic of the quality of beans themselves, the answers are actually much clearer. Though lay people seem to have strong opinions about what brand of coffee beans they buy, any coffee snob worth their weight will tell you what matters is how freshly the beans were roasted. There have been studies which unequivocally establish that coffee beans lose their flavor with the passing of time, both subjectively judged by blinded panelists and with the objective measurement of the chemical compounds, including the loss of aromatic compounds and CO2. What about the price you pay for so-called specialty coffee over generic regular coffee? Is this just wine tasters again, trapped in their own delusions? In researching for this video, I learned that the Specialty Coffee Association has a specific methodology by which bean quality is established, 
as a composite of 10 sensory metrics like body, sweetness, aftertaste, etc. And a 2019 paper by Citipod managed to isolate four compounds, which are the drivers of high quality scores. After a great deal of hedging that the ratings of the SCA judges represent one particular aesthetic of a selected cohort of people, Maxwell did grant me. A 90 point coffee is never an 80 point coffee. And an 80 point coffee is never a 90 point coffee in anyone's, you know, even if you have, if you have 20 people score, Maybe one person does that, but as soon as you get to 20 people, you're never going to have those crossed over. And there is a correlation in compounds there for those. That, that I think you could objectively claim, yeah. But in context, he emphasized much more how arbitrary this choice of taste was. How about getting the brewing process right? There have been some more sensory-oriented papers, but as Kelowna Dashwood indicates, we really do have to get specific. For example, I found a paper that used a panel to assess desirable and undesirable flavors in hot versus cold brew coffee, and another having a panel assess sensory characters based on the degree of roasting brew ratio and brew method. I also found a paper that used sensory data from a panel and principal component analysis to validate language to be used to describing coffee. But if you want some high-level practical advice, the Specialty Coffee Association has an updated brewing chart where they use a sensory panel to determine which amounts of extraction and coffee strength make certain qualities like sourness, bitterness, or sweetness most pronounced. The general model we work with is that not all flavor and texture creating compounds extract at the same rate. First, it's the fruit acids and caffeine, which can taste sour and acidic, which is why under-extracted brews have this taste and can even be salty. After that, you start extracting the caramelized sugars created in the roasting process. This is why well-brewed coffee actually has a natural sweetness to it without needing to add sugar. At this point, if you keep extracting from your beans by letting water continue to dissolve the grinds, you'll start dissolving the much larger and less soluble plant fibers, which tend to taste bitter, dry, and hollow. So if you're trying to use science to get to what we can call good coffee, a lot of it comes down to the assumptions that most people like sweet and most people don't like bitter or sour notes. Beyond that, what's the best comes down to preferences. James Hoffman recently had an informal tasting experiment where it was revealed, for example, that older drinkers prefer darker roasts, probably just because that's what they were used to. I've always wondered about the scoring system because, um, you know, where does it come from, right? Who, who, who decided that floral geishas uh, are rewarded the highest? I think there's a self-selective process. So I don't think it's a coffee personality, but historically that was group consensus, but the groups were pretty small, right? What I mean by that is when I stumbled across high scoring coffee in Melbourne and loved it, well, it's self-selecting. I then pursue that because I like the way it tastes. So I then join that group and I agree with their consensus to some degree, but the person who tastes it goes, hell, this tastes like soap. They don't become obsessed with specialty coffee. They go, ah, oh, this is a bit stupid. And off they go and have their dark roast Italian. So all in all, there is a combination of some chemical analysis, sensory panels, and just everyday experiences of brewers and roasters who incorporate far more than what's specific enough to make its way to a scientific paper that gets you to, can we objectively make coffee good? But what my interview with Kelowna Dashwood brought me to is, the specific aesthetic to which coffee snobs strive represents a certain zeitgeist of what good is, and the fact that popular sells well means that not everyone is seeking the same thing, and they don't have to be. Coffee beauty truly is in the eye of the mug holder. A sincere thanks to Maxwell Kelowna Dashwood for taking his time and giving me an interview so rich in information I will probably have another two videos worth to make out of it, and for his help in fact-checking this video. Maxwell and his partner Leslie are co-founders of the Kelowna Coffee Company, a small chain of UK-based coffee shops and a roastery, as well as co-authors with Christopher Hendon on scientific research papers on the topic of water for brewing coffee. Their book, Water for Coffee, was a success in the specialty coffee world. Maxwell is currently working to publish an updated second edition. Thanks for watching. Remember to stay coffee snobby.